Audiobook title World Tree Apocalypse A Pilot in Another World Lit RPG, 05-06, by Rasmataz. This work belongs to author Rasmataz. Source Royal Road and Scribblehub.com Chapter 5, Hunt Pilot Human May assign Pilot Caretaker stands at the base of the world tree, both of her palms lightly pressed against its surface. Her head is bowed, and her eyes are closed. The sounds of nature fill the air around them the singing of birds and the buzzing of insects, all reveling in the gifts of what ought to be a good spring. A good wind moves through the trees that grow in the shadow of the giant monument, blowing aside the strands of her short, dark hair below her antlers. Pilot sits there, watching her, as he tries to study what exactly it is that she does. The magic that she used to heal him he has access to things like that too now, right? The kestrel is going to be ready to fly again soon, and it will be a big help to him if he understands how to harness a tool like that when he's out there by himself. He doesn't think that he's going to find a way back to his world, to the war that never ends, or to that place where he belongs. But he knows that he doesn't feel right here. The man eyes the pleasant, healthy greenery all around them warily. Bountiful flowers bow their heads to the soft gale. This place is messed up. It's nothing like the world he knows. He feels like a fish out of water, like a silverfish that has left its cover of damp, gray moisture and ran out into the sunlight of an open, bright world on its tiny, skittering legs. Pilot calls caretaker gently from the side. He turns his head back to look at her, his suspicious gaze carrying over. He's just waiting for something to jump out of the trees at any second now some goblin or something new that he hasn't seen yet. She smiles softly, lightly nodding her head to the side, gesturing for him to come over to her. The man waves her off at first, but instead she walks over to him, grabbing his wrist and pulling him along over to the wooden cliff face that makes up just the side of one single root of the monumental tree. Stopping in front of it, she lifts both of her hands, holding them out, and nudges him with her elbow. Does she want him to copy her? Pilot looks at her, and then up along the tree. Pilot, she repeats. Fine, relents Pilot, lifting his hands slowly into the air. She presses them against the tree, looking at him. Warily eyeing it, not sure what she wants from him exactly, he does the same. His hands press forward until the tips of his fingers touch the rough, old bark, followed by his palms. Nothing much happens. He feels a small tingle on his arms, the hairs there standing on end, as if near an electrical current. However, apart from that, no great revelation appears before him. Caretaker closes her eyes again, her hands still resting on the wood of the world tree. Pilot does the same but not before sparing a quick glance at the woods. This doesn't really change much either, but he feels somewhat obligated now to follow through. So he stands there next to her and listens, his senses taking in what there is to take in. Birds sing. Insects buzz. The water of the lake sloshes in and out. The wind whispers as it moves through the trees. The tall grasses and flowers flow rustling as they bow their heads to the elements, only to rise again seconds later. There's a vibration in the ground deep, deep down in it, that carries up through the roots of the tree. Like that of a distant stampede that shakes the world carrying through a metal mast. The great tree groans, quietly swaying as much as is possible for something of its size as its distant boughs are moved by the jet streams of the world. His arm tingles and then something screams. A shrieking, ear-piercing knife of a howl cuts into his senses. The senselessly wailing voice of something both animal and wild being butchered alive. Pilot opens his eyes in surprise, his head about to explode as he lets go of the tree and clutches his skull with one hand, the echo still carrying around inside of it. He looks around in shock, thinking that it was caretaker screaming. It isn't. 
She simply stands exactly where she is, as if nothing happened or as if she hadn't heard anything. Pilot's other hand has pulled out his pistol as he spun around, aiming it into the perfect, bountiful forest with paranoid eyes, expecting something to lunge out of it at any second. But nothing comes except for a single, fat, buzzing bee that lazily drifts through the spring breeze. What was that? He slowly lowers his arm again, looking back at Caretaker and at the world tree. Caretaker opens her eyes, looking back at him. Pilot, she says again, nodding to the tree with a curious but welcoming expression and gesturing for him to come back to experience whatever it is she wants him to see. Pilot holsters his pistol again, ignoring her as he goes down to get back to work. This place is sick. There's something very wrong about this world. He has to get off of the ground. The kestrel works. He just needs to do a few basic repairs and figure out a new fuel source, and then he can fly out of here. There's enough in her to start the plane and let her taxi for a minute, but flying is out of the question. Until then, he needs to buy himself a little time. Pilot empties out his pistol's spring-loaded magazine letting seven bullets drop into his hand before he slides the emptied magazine back inside the weapon. It is now 2400 hours midnight. Sidearm ammunition restored. Pilot stares at the darkness above him. Quietly, he rolls his head, looking across the dark underground chamber at his host, who is sleeping on the other bed. She is a bit of an awkward sleeper, rearranging herself repeatedly in the middle of the night. Every time he looks her way, caretaker is laid out differently. This time, her face is pressed down into the bedding, and one of her legs is up against the wall at a strange angle. Silently, Pilot gets up, grabs his things, puts on his clothes and jacket, in which he stores his extra ammunition, and walks to the doorway. His pistol and knife rest against his leg as he steps out into the night, closing his jacket. It's cold at night near the water of the giant lake. Standing there at the edge of the little ledge, he looks down at the world around them and at the dense forests inside the valley. Goblins There's a hostile force nearby, scouting the region in numbers. His eyes scan the area, looking for signs of an encampment. He's in a critical state, and the Kestrel isn't ready to fly just yet. His host is an injured, unarmed civilian. Their choices are evacuation on foot, which is a death trap since he is hardly mobile. A siege situation on this hill, which is a death trap since he's only one man and any competent force will scale the hill in numbers from many angles at once. Or option three, a preemptive strike. He doesn't feel obligated to care because of the world tree. That damn thing makes him uneasy. There's something off about it. But Caretaker will get butchered if he doesn't do something about this infestation. If this is a scouting force, they will be one of many scout troops. The main numbers of the goblin force will go to where the scouts report back from, as those are easy territories to win. Those dangerous places where the scouts don't return from will be visited later, once the backlands are secure and surrounded. So he needs to make this a dangerous place. It's a postponement of a larger problem, but buying time for him to heal and for him to fix the kestrel is his best shot. If he's being warned about an invasion, it's safe to say that he needs more than the eight bullets that are in his pistol. Invasion is quite the meaty word. It implies numbers. A wisp of smoke, only ever so slight, drifts free from the fog-laden treetops in the distance. Pilot's eyes narrow on it, focusing as he watches the subtle tendrils of a fire's spirit rise differently than the sinking moisture, reflecting starlight from itself. The smoke, on the other hand, absorbs the moon and starlight, with the ashen particulate being matte and dull. The back of the valley, to the east, they're on this side of the lake and maybe an hour on foot. That's where Tango has set up. Pilot eyes several significant landmarks on the way a big needle tree, some rock formations, and a glade before he grabs his gear and heads into the valley, 
traveling light. He only intends to need a few hours. It's hard going with these wounds. Whatever medicine caretaker gave him sure kicks like shit, but damn if his body doesn't feel like it too. He's been shot before, hit with shrapnel before, and he's even crashed his plane before several times, but he's never been busted up to this degree. This was a rough one. But even with all of that in mind, the fact that he is able to move at all is a testament to whatever healing talent the girl has and to whatever power is held by the forces of the universe that brought him here to this place. In the old world, Pilot is sure that Caretaker would be worth a fortune for him in promotions as a prisoner if he could bring her back. The lab coats would love to know everything about her medicine and methods. Uniquely powerful ointments, salves, and things like that can turn the tide of a war if converted into an industrially produced good. Churning men out of beds in days instead of weeks could be enough to shift countless fronts. And that's before they take a saw and scalpel to her antlers and the rest of her. In times of crisis, bad men become good men in the eyes of the nation. If he ever does get back to his home, he's going to keep what happened here to himself. Pilot looks around the forest. It looks like an old growth, temperate forest. Hell, ancient growth might be the right phrase. There are primarily deciduous trees and very few needle trees. Although he can't quite identify any of the species apart from a few pines. Pine trees were a primary focus of his survival training. They're far more useful than one would think. From the bark to the needles to the sap, everything can be used for a variety of applications, from paste to salves to a vitamin-rich tea. He's seen such collections in caretaker's home as well. This means that he's at a mid-range latitude in the world, which, at this point, really just further confirms what he already knows that he is nowhere near the war or his home. The mission that he was flying was in the north, far further north than anyone could have come from to be able to land at the equator in a crashing plane. He creeps through the forest, taking it slow as he moves from one tree to the next always eyeing the darkness. Tonight is the night of a nearly full moon, a little more than three-quarters of the way there. It's bright enough to see well enough to move. Confirming his direction, he looks up at the solitary needle tree, standing by itself in the middle of the forest. Good, he's on the right path. His navigation is confirmed by the presence of markings in the tall tree. Someone has carved into it with a crude knife, having written sigils in the bark that he can't manage to decipher. But the height of the carvings fits his target's stature. Goblins. The man continues, stalking the forest until he reaches the large rock formation, and then continues eastward until he sees the glade. Then, a few minutes later, he finds what he's looking for. Tango. From the darkness, he watches them trying to understand the nature of the enemy. There are a good few of them, just below a baker's dozen in number. All of them are sitting and lazing around a camp. There are no tents, but there are one or two of frames made out of sticks and branches, but there is little effort put into them other than just stacking the broken wood together. There's a fire pit, which is the most advanced thing that he sees here. For it, Two holes are dug next to each other at the base of a tree, connected underground by a small tunnel the size of an arm. The campfire is burning not on the surface of the forest, but inside of the hole closest to the tree. The other hole is empty and acts as a source of oxygen. The smoke rises up along the base of a tree, the boughs catching and dispersing it in the leaves. The glow of the fire is hidden by the hole it stems from. This is a classic setup for scouting parties on the down low who need warmth, even in his own world. These creatures, or monsters, are simple and rough in a sense, but they're apparently clever too. It would be best not to underestimate them. One of them is awake and on patrol. But given its lackadaisical meandering, it really doesn't seem too serious about its work. It seems that they don't expect there to be much of a threat here. The goblin wanders around the camp until it eventually reaches the area where he is. 
Very mysteriously, it vanishes into the night, a hand covering its mouth as it is yanked into the darkness. The battle is over. Pilot has killed Goblin. 10 EXP. Level up. Pilot has leveled up to level 03. New ability. Munitions voice in the trees. Passive. Grants enhanced night vision abilities and a 150% damage bonus to all ambush attacks. New ability. Mechanics, jury rigging. Passive. Allows the repurposing of monster components, drops, and equipment into usable raw materials for the repair and modification of your aircraft. Pilot pulls the body back into the forest, plundering it for anything useful and then hides the corpse in the underbrush. The dead goblin seems to be wearing some colorful beads around its arms. He takes some of those, the brighter ones, and leaves the rest. The goblin yawns, stretching and scratching itself as it rises to its feet, rousing from its slumber. It's still dark. The morning has yet to come. Smacking its lips, it idly rises up and walks past its sleeping tribe mates as it goes to relieve itself against a tree. Tired and sleep-dazed, the monster begins to urinate, its gaze scanning the darkness and then landing on the glint of something shiny not far off. Curious, it looks around to make sure that nobody else saw what it saw, and then it shakes itself dry, quietly skulking forward toward the unexpected treasure. Someone lost their beads. They now lay in between a circle of trees right outside the camp, catching the moonlight beautifully. A hand covers the wandering goblin's mouth, and a knife runs across its throat. The beads are covered in black, glistening blood, but they do remain very shiny, just in a different way now. The battle is over. Pilot has killed goblin. 10 EXP This goes on for hours with Pilot patiently waiting for them to stir, never scaring them awake. By then, more have died in the forest under similar circumstances, leaving five alive in the camp, but all still fast asleep. These rests are all easily finished. He just goes in, covers the softening glow of the fire pit with a large, giant leaf from the world tree that had been lying here, and makes his way from sleeping goblin to sleeping goblin. Only the last one sees him coming but reacts too little, too late, unable to grab its own knife before the steel blade of his standard-issue survival knife severs its carotid artery. It bleeds out in seconds. The battle is over. Pilot has killed Goblin. 10 EXP. Level up. Pilot has leveled up to level 04. New ability. Munitions Bunny Thumper Toggle During nighttime, allows the manifestation of a compatible, unusually potent pistol suppressor for your sidearm. This will reduce weapon noise significantly. That should be the last of them, he thinks. Pilot looks down at his pistol, unholstering it and eyeing the suppressor that has been added to it by some unseen power, significantly increasing its length and shifting its balance. He's not sure how exactly it fits into the holster just now, honestly. It really shouldn't have. Magic is a strange thing. Something stirs in the bushes. Pilot looks up as two goblins' long patrolmen likely return at an extremely inopportune moment for them. The three all exchange a rather awkward glance for a moment as they each survey the situation. Caretaker yawns, stretching herself out as she wakes in the dead of night, still early before sunrise, thirsty. Her leg has fallen asleep from being at a weird angle. Rubbing her eyes, she sits upright. A quiet thumping comes from the forest outside. Once. Twice. Then a third time a moment later. She blinks, listening and trying to decipher the odd noise that comes and goes quickly dissipating into the morning mist. The rabbits must be fighting again. They like to stomp the dirt when they get feisty. Maybe there are some outside of the den? 
laughing to herself at the thought. Caretaker looks over at the empty bed across from hers, shaking her head at the irresponsible human who is likely outside by the plane again. Caretaker drinks from her bowl. She can only assume that Pilot is going to come back with his wounds full of lake water soon, and she'll have to deal with it. Instead, an hour later, Pilot comes back with a small, crude sack full of colorful beads, a fist and pockets full of dirty knives, and a body-covered head to toe in the dark blood of many dead monsters. The two of them stare at one another as he stands in the doorway, absolutely dripping with filth. No, scolds caretaker, grabbing a long stick from the wall and pushing him back out of the door as he tries to take a step inside dragging in the stench of murder into her home. Only after the man is prodded, poked, and shooed all the way back down the hill like a wayward animal, all the way back down to the lake, where she watches carefully as he washes himself clean away his sin, is he allowed to come back inside. Then she has to redo all of his washed-off medicine and ointment once again instead of starting her chores, which she is falling further and further behind on day after day. At least he helps her keep things orderly, but still. Caretaker sighs, feeling very exhausted. It's like running after an energetic child. If all humans are like this, she's glad that she never had to deal with them before. Something dabs the side of her face and she opens her eyes, watching as he now applies the medicine to the healing laceration on her cheek. They're such troublesome creatures. Chapter 6 Present. Caretaker. Dryad. Female sign. Caretaker. Rain pours softly outside of the den, droplets striking against the dense forest canopy. No, says caretaker sternly, lifting her hands and slowly pushing Pilot back. She doesn't speak his variant of the human language but she assumes her point is to be made clear by her disapproving expression and shaking head. The man is bigger and stronger than her in his peak state, but right now he's injured and easy to push around. She makes full use of that. No seems to be the only word she gets to use at the moment. He sits down on the edge of the seat that she guides him to before sighing and walking off to do her chores. Even if there is nobody else left but her, she still has to do her work. The forest must be taken care of. The great rod is not here yet, and until it is, it is her duty to make sure that nature stays serene and in good health. Pilot waits until she goes away a second later, and then rises back up to his feet. No. Snaps caretaker from across the room, getting probably ignored by him. He just won't stop, no matter what she does. Caretaker sits there, exasperated, weaving together threads of bark fiber as she watches Pilot, who is not fully healed in the least nor will he ever be if he keeps this up slowly lower himself down in another unnatural, controlled movement that she can't quite figure out the purpose of. He has been doing things like this all day, sometimes pushing himself off of the ground with his palms while lying flat, sometimes stretching in odd ways sometimes trying to hold his weight on a branch and then starting, but never finishing to climb up it, and now this. She's done nothing all day but run after him like a mama bear chasing her foolish cub to try and stop it from running into the river. Every time he hurts himself because he's an odd, dumb creature, it becomes her problem to fix and she has enough of those already. His hands are outstretched straight ahead of him, his eyes forward and his neck and back align straight as he drops down into a squatting position and then slowly rises back up again, exhaling. Caretaker frowns as she watches him undergo his human nonsense. She's just waiting for one of his wounds to rip open. It's only been a couple days since she first mended them. He still lets her wash them and apply the medicine but it will take days or weeks more for him to properly heal, assuming that he will just rest silently as he ought to. But instead, the man holds out one leg straight ahead of himself as he then tries to squat down again, this time on just one leg. Why? Predictably, he falls over, 
wincing and clutching his side as a strained muscle rips through the skin that had only just begun to heal. Pilot lays on the ground, collecting himself and gritting his teeth together as she leans over him with a deep-seated annoyance in her eyes. N.O. Scolds caretaker, glaring down at him with her hands on her hips. The dried groans, but differently, to how he is doing, as she watches the blood leak out of his side and onto the floor. This has all been rather awkward for her since that moment by the water a few days ago. Was her behavior back then inappropriate? Pilot has saved her life twice now. Both times from goblins. The great rod is approaching slowly. But it doesn't matter how slowly it approaches, because even the furthest, most delicate tendrils of its presence are seemingly enough to kill her. A single goblin, a monster that the warriors of the races of man and elf laugh at. She still doesn't know what to do. What if she is attacked again and Pilot is not around? Is she allowed to defend herself, like any animal would? Or will this be frowned upon by the spirits of her pacifistic sisters, who are with the soil and the trees now? She doesn't want to die. She loves life. She loves living. She loves the birds, nature, the water, and the trees. Caretaker loves the feeling of the wind on her skin and the sensation the rain creates as it runs down her shoulders. When she almost died before, it terrified her. It haunts her. At night now, while she sleeps, she still feels the fear in her heart that she felt then during the attack. She had never felt anything like that before. She was so scared, so confused, and so surprised. She has night terrors now visions of her sister's faces and mangled bodies. She can still feel the crack of the rock against her bones and head, like it was still happening. The dried walks through the forest, kneeling down as she feels the base of an old tree as she thinks. The old thing is doing well. Her eyes wander up it. One of her sisters planted this tree a long time ago. It thrives now despite having been sickly at times in its youth. Nature can be coldly cruel. It is not within a dryad's responsibility to make sure that everyone is always healthy. Sometimes in nature things die. Wolves hunt rabbits. Owls hunt mice. Death is as natural as birth. It isn't something to be avoided, run from, or stopped. Nature is a delicate system. It must not be interfered with too often. The animals ought to be left to their own, just the same as the trees and plants ought to be. But it is their duty as caretakers to make sure that a healthy balance is maintained and that the will of the world tree is followed, although it may be hard to understand sometimes. This tree with its beautiful blossoms is one such example. Her sister had been given a vision, so the story goes, to save this young sapling. And so she did. And now, generations later, here it stands as a full, strong, mature tree. Its verdant crown is laden with countless heavy bulbs that have yet to emerge into flowering blossoms this year. They are very beautiful when they come. They are actually some of the most beautiful things in the whole valley. Why did the world tree desire for this to be the way things are? Why is this one tree special when hundreds of other saplings die every day in the massive forest? She does not know. Looking back over her shoulder, caretaker stares at the human, who is by the edge of the water. He's doing something with his plane again. But she doesn't quite understand it. She knows that it came from the sky, so her imagination says that he wants the construction to rise back up into it again. But is something like that really possible? As long as he isn't undergoing any more nonsense that makes her life harder than it needs to be. Soup, says caretaker, holding up the bowl of cold soup. Dryads don't use fire. All of their food is a mixture of prepared harvested berries, herbs, tubers, mushrooms, or fermented things. Soup, replies Pilot, taking it from her. He has such a funny accent. But she doesn't laugh. 
He's learning. He must be from very far away. The humans in this region share a tongue with the dryads. Pilot says something else, speaking in his own language that she doesn't understand. She assumes it to be an expression of gratitude. You're welcome, she says. He repeats after her, trying to pick up some things, it seems. This is something they've been doing now and then, now that she's talking to him again. Well, talking. She needed some time to recover and process after the incident by the water a few days ago. It was just surprising, really. On top of everything else that happened. She supposes that it makes sense, but she had, out of all the events that would perhaps one day come to her, never considered that one to be possible. It just wasn't ever relevant for the life she lived here, secluded with her sister caretakers. The two of them have their meal and then she blocks Pilot from leaving, shoving him back to the bed and repeating her rejection of his leaving until he finally gives in and goes to sleep or at least pretends to, until she leaves. Honestly. She's never going to get rid of him at this rate. Looking back at him as she stands at the doorway, she then walks out herself into the rain. Human customs are very odd, are they not? 